in chapter 4 a couple of weeks ago was um, basically we said it was the clash of cultures as we have the, the song of Lamech, the first poetry in the Bible and uh, known traditionally as the sword song uh, because the line of Cain, uh, instead of obeying God and God's plan and will for them, of course, it's in a sense of curse to be wanderers. He says, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to build a city. I'm going to stay put. And it was kind of an in-your-face kind of a thing. And it kind of continues then through his lineage. And we see it in that first poetry in the, in the Song of Lamech. Now, at the end of chapter 4, then there's this little line of hope because we have the birth of someone else. And then it says, and then men began to call in the name of the Lord or proclaim the name of the Lord. So we've got a glimmer of hope at the end of chapter 4 because things are growing dark and they're degenerating very quickly. Uh, but then we have the birth of Seth. Now what chapter 5 does then, it backs up, it goes back to Adam and Eve and then begins to deliver the genealogy to get us from Adam to Seth to eventually to Noah because things are going to obviously get darker and darker. God is going to keep his promise of Genesis 3.15. He's going to bring the Messiah that will deliver the world from, from their sins. And he's got to deliver a, a, a godly family to be able to do that. And that's what G, uh, Genesis chapter 5 is really, really all about. Well, let's jump right in here to verse 1 and 2. The potential of mankind is made into the image of God. Some of the things that we're going to say are kind of a reiteration of our study in chapter 1. But nonetheless, uh, verse 1, it says, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. And the day that God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. So uh, the reminder of the, that phrase, imagio Dei, that were made in the image of God. And uh, therefore, we've got a lot of potential. And one is the obvious to have a, a relationship with the Lord. So with this new godly line, the line of Seth or the Sethites, uh, they are reminded, as we need to be reminded sometimes too, because it's a lost uh, concept in our own culture, uh, because we would act a lot differently if everybody remembered that everybody else uh, is made in the image of God. What, it, what does it mean to us? Uh, again, it's not talking uh, certainly about a physical body, but it means that we, God thinks, and therefore we're capable of rational thought. The fact that we can reason, can problem solve, and so forth, is an ability that God has given us that is distinct from all other creatures because we're made in the image of God. God has emotions. We see them expressed. Therefore, we have desires, and we have feelings uh, as well. God governs his actions, and he gives us the ability to have a free will choice that we might uh, also have that, that aspect in our own lives. And of course, God will do everything short of going against our free will to show us his love and his mercy and that we might come to faith in, in him. Sometimes it's been said that God has taken, it's a thousand steps away from God to man, and God's taken 999 of those steps towards us and he's asking us to take the one, but he will not go against our own free will. As Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem at his rejection, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to come to you and come to you like a hen gathering her chicks under her wings. But you were, you were not willing. This is what I wanted to do, Jesus says, but he honors their free will choice. Free will choice is a very important thing. It's part of being made in the image of God. From our study in chapter 1, we also learned that as image bearers, we have the capacity to hear God's word. Adam and Eve were able to hear. The others were able to hear and recognize when God was speaking to them. And as Paul says in Romans 1, everybody has two witnesses because we're made in the image of God. They have the ability to look out and see creation, recognize that there is a creator. And they have uh, an inner witness in terms of their own conscience uh, a moral conscience, that's all part of being able to hear God, recognize his wor world that we live in, as well as his word. Also, as image bearers, we're charged to rule the earth. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, uh, 26, it's a, a privilege as well as a responsibility. And then thirdly, the last part of that, the image of God in us suggests the possibility of, 
uh, not just knowing of God's existence, but having an intimate relationship with God. So great potential. And so this godly line of Seth is reminded once again at the outset of the genealogy that we're made in the image of God. That potential and then also includes some things we're not to do as well as some things we're to do. But the things that we're not to do, we see one of them in Genesis 9, 6. If you want to go a couple of pages to your right there. It says, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made him. Because people are made in the image of God, we are not to murder anyone. And again, there's this very... It's talking about premeditated murder, and when premeditated murder occurs, there should be capital punishment against it, God says here in his word, but we shouldn't murder because people are made in the image of God. And certainly, we sometimes refer to our current culture as a culture of death because we've lost this concept of being made in the image of God. If we understand, if a mother understood that the unborn infant within her is made in the image of God, she would not take its life. But uh, that goes on uh, to uh, incredible lengths uh, in the days that we live in and, and uh, should give us all cause to fear what may come upon us as a result of, of what we do in terms of the unborn children in this country. Every year in the legislate, legislature now, uh, we're going to be faced with the idea of mercy killing uh, and the idea of somebody that's suffering to be able to have a doctor come and, and kill them. Uh, nobody would consider that. No one would have considered that a generation ago because this idea was ingrained in us that we're made uh, in the image of God. It's something right in our founding documents that our founding fathers recognize, not fully implemented, of course, is uh, there was uh, terrible discrimination against other people that were made in the image of God. But uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of that has been rectified. But as believers, we need to recognize that every man and woman and child is made in the image of God. We are not to murder. The second thing is in Colossians, as we jump to the New Testament, Paul there says in Col Colossians 3.9, Do not lie to one another, since you are... Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and to put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Paul says that we're not to lie to other people because they're made in the image of God. In fact, you recall from our study in Colossians that Paul is writing to the church there. So this is addressed to Christians and literally in the Greek it says stop lying. <laughs> it's not just saying don't lie. It's saying you Christians stop lying because the people you're lying to are made in the image of God. And then James tells us in James 3.8, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, or again in the image of God. So James tells us, thirdly, we're not, we're not to murder, uh, we're not to lie, we're not even to speak evil or gossip. With our tongue, we can bless God or curse men. It's not just talking about saying, uh, saying four-letter words in terms of cursing. It's saying evil or, or negative things about people. Why not? Because that person you're talking about is made in the image of God. That's the idea. That's the reasoning here. So <clears throat> there is great potential because we're all made in the image of God. There's a great privilege because we can have a personal relationship with God. But there's some things that we're not to do uh, if we have this understanding as well. The third thing that's mentioned here is the potential includes procreation. And we noticed that and addressed back in chapter 1 when this is first brought up in verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And as we go through uh, 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 the genealogy here in chapter 5, we'll see that they did that. <laughs> they, they, they took that command from, uh, from God. And, uh, and, and therefore, couples that are married, if they are physically able, God anticipates and expects them to procreate and have children because he sees it as a tremendous blessing. Uh, again, in that verse in 28, notice, and God blessed them and said to them. So how does God bless us? He says, have children. That's, that's going to be a tremendous, tremendous blessing. Later in, uh, in Genesis 9, 1, 
It says, and so God blessed Noah and his sons. And what does he say? What is the great blessing? Be fruitful and multiply and, uh, and fill the earth. In verse 7, it says a command. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Psalm 127, the psalmist says in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. This is probably pretty obvious, but just to say that, according to God, the way that he would really bless us is by giving us children. You know, some, I've actually had a young couple say to me one time, yeah, we're praying about whether we should have children or not. I said, don't pray about it, just plan on it. You know, <laughs> just, just plan on it, you know. But we want to have God's will for our life. That's God's will for your life. Now, you know, if, and, and if he gives you children, it's a blessing from the Lord. Uh, a way that God blesses us, according to God, is to give us children. And yet, again, we have a culture where we have people that say, well, we'd rather be dinks. You know what a dink is? Double income, no kids. That's, I don't know if you keep up with the vernacular, but uh, uh, I think it's okay if you're retired and your kids are all grown. I mean, I know one guy told me, yeah, my wife and I are now dinks. Really? What's that? This is a while back. Yeah, double income, no kids. Are grown, we're both still working. Uh, but actually, the, the phrase is normally applied to people in their 20s and their 30s that are married that have decided not to have kids. I understand that from people that don't know the Lord, that don't have this concept of having a relationship with God and understand the commands and the precepts of God, which is to, as a married couple, to have children. So don't pray about it. Just plan on it. Because as far as God is concerned, it's a blessing. And, and it is a blessing. And God uh, yeah, teaches us so much through, through having kids. And again, I realize that not everybody is, uh, is able. And, uh, and there's other, other, other ways and methods through adoption and so forth. And uh, we pray for those that are seeking that route as well, that God would bless them uh, in, uh, in that way. Kathy and I, I don't remember what the situation was, but we were just talking a couple weeks ago about, about something somebody said or did. Well, why did, they, why did they say that? Or why did they do that? No kids. <laughs> it's like, they're single. You know, don't get it. You know, because there's just something about having children that you're constantly serving. You, you know, and uh, we've remarked several times, we you know, we were, we, we'd come to the Lord and we, we thought we knew what it was. We're trying to, you know, grade in the kingdom, servant of all. We're trying to serve and have that kind of attitude. And then you have children. It's just like takes it to a whole nother level because it's like 24-7, you know. And uh, God teaches us so much through our kids. But as far as God's concerned, it's, uh, it's one of the great blessings uh, in, in life. And, and I'm sorry to say that we have to just reiterate that and even say that. Uh, in the culture that we're living in because we're still in that culture war, the clash of the cultures that began back in Genesis 4. So a great potential for us because we're made in the image of God. And secondly, we see the penalty of sin that brought death. And we're going to look at that in verses 3 to 32. I'm going to take a little break in the middle, cover a couple of these verses in point 3. But uh, verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years. And begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days that Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahatlael. And after he begot Mahatlael, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahatlael lived 65 years and begot Jared, who went on and opened a chain of jewelry stores in the United States. Just thought I'd 
I'm not sure if it's the same guy or not. Just threw it in. After he begot Jared, Mahatlael lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahatlael were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And now I'm going to jump down to verse 25. We'll come back and look at 21 to 24 in a moment. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his son Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed, and he begot Noah. Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So let's go back and look at the penalty, but obviously the penalty of sin is death, as Paul would see in, uh, in Romans 5 uh, there. And we see that formula here, and he died, and he died. Adam lived 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 912, and he died, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, Methuselah being the oldest, 31 short of actually living uh, a millennial. But notice the pattern. There's the name. There's the age at the birth of the first son, the length of the remaining life, and then the age uh, of death. And one thing as we continue, you'll see a tremendous drop off in terms of the length of age once we, we hit the flood. After the flood, men, women do not live as long, dramatically less. There's a couple of uh, explanations for this, and I think both, maybe both of them together help us understand what's going on. One of the things that we know geologically is around the globe, even places in the Antarctic or whatever, they find fossilized vegetation that would lead us to believe that the entire earth at one point in time had a subtropical uh, climate and uh, had the vegetation to bear that out. Uh, we know that uh, when Noah, as we study, will continue to study, when God tells him it's going to rain, basically he says, what's that? That it's never rained before. So the earth basically was, was watered by a type of perhaps canopy system that was around the earth that was like a giant cloud. Uh, and of course, the flood itself was caused by the, the uh, earth being broken up and the channels of water that are there, which scientists tell us are there today and are sufficient to cover the whole, the whole earth. So in terms of the length decreasing dramatically after the flood, uh, going with the idea of a vapor canopy, it would have withheld or kept out uh, the UV rays that basically engage and, and speed up the aging process. So that's, that's the, the best explanation I've ever heard. And then added to that, you have the degenerating effect within our genetic code that is taking place as a result of sin as well. <clears throat> the fall of man affects the environment and affected uh, our, our thinking, affected us spiritually, and it affects us uh, in terms of our genetic makeup because now you have sickness and disease and so forth that's brought upon mankind. And uh, this dramatically alters then the age of, uh, of man. As I uh, mentioned uh, in the first service, of course, uh, uh, Charlie and his buddies are trying to undo all that and see if they can get it back to up there eight or 900 years. It, uh, he, uh, he fooled me yesterday. He said, I want you to come out to the... Uh, the, uh, the Disney project and see uh, that uh, see that at its completion. I'd gone out after they had the topping off party and got to go on the roof of the building and see the, the whole project out there that their company group builders have been working on. And they had a Mahalo day for all of the, uh, the workers, construction workers, and we went out and, and uh, I ended up with his, uh, his uh, good friend, uh, Bobby Lee, 
He was the uh, former boxing uh, commissioner for a long time. So you, so you guys like Danny are going, okay, I know who that is, you know. And uh, <laughs> so we're, and, uh, and, and Bobby is, is 90. So he's like the young guy with, with Charlie. And the two of them walk my legs off. I mean, I'm taking ibuprofen later. I'm icing my knee. You know, they're just all over this place, up and down stairs. And, uh, you know, I kept saying, hey, uh, Bobby, would you like to sit over here in the shade? Uh, you know, there's a chair right here. No, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> okay, then. You know, there is an elevator over here. We don't have to keep going up and down. They say, no, I'm good. You know, and it's just like, how about some water? Would you like some water? No, thank you. It's like, give me a break. You know, I'm dying, you know. Would you, would you stop and let me rest for a little bit here? I think I need to get in the shade, you know. My uh, solar panels got charged for the whole week. I mean, we're just like going and going. But normally, age is decreasing uh, as we go along here. But there are those, uh, those exceptions. Secondly, the penalty includes death. Uh, notice it says over and over again, and then he died. Kid Hughes writes about this and says, The day came fast for the long-lived patriarchs. At death, life is short for all. Where did it go? We wonder. Only yesterday I was young and running through the fields. Vast multitudes of people have been born bearing the image of God. Originals all so beautiful, so few, full of potential. But they have uh, been plowed under. The rains have washed their names from the tombstones. Their bones are no more. Death spread its dark cloud over the patriarch's bright hopes. And the cycle went on and on and on, and he died, and he died, and he died. And it continues. Every time you drive by a cemetery or go by Hawaii Memorial Park, and you look out there, you can say, that is a testimony to the fact that sin entered this world. Paul says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin... And thus, death spread to all men because all sinned. But he goes on and then in verse 15 and say, but there's the free gift. The free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Paul says, here's the deal. Sin came to everybody through one man. And in the same way, through one man, Jesus Christ, the free gift of God, his grace can come to all men uh, as well. That's his argument uh, there. But we can all testify that surely sin has entered the world because all men die. Uh, Jesus says this about conquering death in John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Jesus has conquered death, and, uh, and that's what we celebrated, of course, and, and uh, praise God for last week as we celebrated Resurrection Day. The penalty, though, includes hope. There was hope given uh, in the name, uh, as well as the length of life of these generations. And just some of the numbers here are, are kind of interesting. Uh, they all live over 800 years. Uh, if you and I lived uh, uh, 800 years, we would have been born in the Middle Ages. It, it kind of puts put things in, in context in terms of the, the sweep of history of how old these, these uh, men and women were and the ability to pass on information uh, and so forth. Uh, from Adam to Noah was 1,656 years. And again, this is one of those areas where I don't believe there's gaps in the genealogy because it's so specific. It seems to be really making a, a point here, unlike uh, other genealogies that are broken up in, in a Hebrew poetic form, like in Matthew's gospel where you've got 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations, and then you compare it, you'll see, well, not everybody's mentioned, but it's, it's set up to make a point. I don't think that's the case uh, here. Uh, therefore, if you look at the 1,656 years, it would mean that Adam and Lamech would have been alive together for the last 46 years of Adam's life. So Adam is on the scene. He's spoken directly with God. And again, at this point in time, the Garden of Eden is still there. The seraphim are there guarding it during this whole time. It's not an issue of, should we believe in God? Yeah, like, kind of like, look right over there. You know, it's like, you can go talk to that guy. He Talk to him. 
used to live in that garden there. You know, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big, uh, big issue. You know, when you talk to your kids uh, about, uh, uh, about the Lord at that time, nobody from the ACEO was going to sue you. You just, you know, they weren't even around. And uh, uh, so belief wasn't the issue. It was really whether they were going to <clears throat> follow the line of Cain and uh, be in rebellion against or, or walk with the Lord. Uh, Methuselah lived 600 years after Noah was born. Lamech lived 595 years after Noah was born. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. His sons were 100 years old. Therefore, Lamech would have died five years before the flood. Methuselah would have died, and then the flood came, which is uh, very interesting. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Methuselah. Right, very important to remember that. <coughs> one of the early trips when Pastor Chuck was coming over to do one of the uh, How to Walk conferences, and I was probably on staff with Bill, and I was one of those guys that went down to pick up people at the airport, get them to their hotels and so forth. And uh, I'm walking along out there with Tom Mouch. Tom uh, has been serving at the Bible College uh, for a number of years. He's kind of like everybody's grandpa there and stuff. And uh, Tom was the uh, tennis coach at Punahou for uh, a number of years. Uh, and in fact, uh, he was there at one point in time when they had a mentorship program uh, to try to plug in young troubled guys with somebody that would help mentor him. Uh, and he got assigned this one young guy uh, that was at school there who was going to his uncle's communist party uh, meetings once a month. He was drinking. He was smoking. He was having a lot of trouble. And Tom did his best to try to mentor him. But he says, apparently, I didn't too well because he did go on and become the president of the United States. But it's the guy in the White House now, but the troubled youth at one time. Tom did his best, said, sorry, I didn't do a better job. I wish I could have led him to the Lord. But uh, Tom's there at the Bible College. We're walking along with Tom, and, uh, and he says to me, he says, by the way, Tim, uh, who's the oldest man in the Bible? And it's like, you know, it's like, there's Chuck right there, deer in the headlights. I better get this right. It's like the wheels are turning real, real, real quick. Uh, Methuselah. But um, praise the Lord. It's like Tom said, yeah, that's right. He went on to start talking about something else. And it's like, thank you, Tom. Ask me Bible trivia in front of Pastor Chuck. I just love it, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do believe in that proverb, you know, that... Uh, you know, even, even the fool is thought wise if it remains silent. And I, I'd rather would it remain silent, but he wasn't letting me. But uh, what we're going to see, and the reason I kind of want to make a big deal about Methuselah, because I want you to associate that with the grace of God. Judgment is going to come. We're going to find that Enoch, the tremendous man of God, who becomes one of the first prophets and predicts the judgment from coming, but part of that judgment would be it wouldn't come. Notice that Methuselah dies and then the flood comes. God extends his grace and holds back judgment as long as he possibly can. How long? As long as he ends up causing Methuselah to be the longest man that ever lived. And that's how we should associate that man and his name and the length of life. Now, in terms of, it says, and they had sons and daughters. And this will kind of be a little more of a piece of information for our study on the flood. But uh, let's say that's all they had. In other words, they each had at least two boys and at least two girls. Might have had a whole lot more. They lived hundreds of years. If they only had four children each, uh, and you multiply that towards the uh, 1,656 years, you would have a population similar to the earth today. So when we think about the, the flood, we think of a couple hundred people, you know, trying to get on the ark, and it's too late. It, it wasn't like that at all. It was worldwide, as we'll see, uh, and it was a tremendous judgment of God and a sober reminder that God will judge once again. The words of Enoch, the prophet, will come true, as we'll see in a moment. Let's go on and look at his life now. The purpose of mankind can be seen in Enoch, verses 21 to 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And he begot, uh, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So the placement of Enoch's uh, uh, name and life in the midst of this genealogy is, uh, is certainly dramatic because 
he is in juxtaposition to Lamech, uh, you know, who basically ends up being the evil one who pins the song in terms of his rebellion against God. He is seventh in the line. And, uh, and we have a Lamech, who is seventh in the line, who in contrast to that walks with God. So these two men are the antithesis of each other. Uh, and uh, they are as great as the difference between heaven and hell uh, itself. Uh, the purpose, again, is seen in his Enoch's walking with God. And uh, we see that he begins to walk with God at the birth of his son, which uh, is... Uh, uh, I would say probably not all that uncommon. And uh, I don't want to do a show of hands or anything, but I, I would say there's probably more than just a, a couple of us, including myself, that, uh, that when you realize that you're going to have a son or a daughter, you're going to have a child, suddenly if you have any, any thought of uh, a relationship with the Lord, you suddenly begin to realize that whatever it is, I better get it together here because I have this tremendous responsibility. Of course, you have a responsibility to care for and put a roof over their heads and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. But I think even spiritually, it becomes uh, much more significant. And that was the, the case with Kathy and I. I mean, when she got pregnant with, uh, with Melissa, we uh, decided at that point, okay, we've kind of visited some churches, but we better really find a church now. We, we wanted some place to go, some place to plug in. We wanted her to be in Sunday school, to grow in the church and, uh, and we got just a lot more serious about our own relationship with the Lord and, and plugging in with a, a local fellowship. Uh, and I think there's a, a dynamic in that that is significant, Then God uses it to kind of drive us to do what we would want to do and probably should do otherwise. Stu Weber in his, uh, his uh, I think it was his first book, Tender Warrior, uh, mentions a statistic there that is uh, very interesting, and I'll probably mention this again on Father's Day as I normally do, but uh, uh, the gals can nod their head on that day and go, yeah, he mentioned that before, and the guys will be going, wow, I didn't know that, but uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay at least uh, repeating some of these things, but uh, uh, in the book there, he defines an active believer, and uh, people, you know, as far as a family, you know, pray together, attend church on a regular basis. So there's, it's not just say has a belief system, but kind of really uh, qualifies this thing as a, quote, active believer. And then he says, when a, when a father and mother are both active believers in the home, according to this uh, fairly extensive survey, there is a 75% chance that their children will also be active believers. When in the home only the mother is an active believer, there's a 15% chance that children will also be active believers. That's quite a dramatic drop. Of course, God's not in statistics. He'll save anybody that calls on the name of the Lord. But I think it does make a point that God puts in to man the potential in a dad to have a tremendous a tremendous spiritual influence over the lives of his children. Even though mom is the one there, probably with the most hours and time and patience and you know, even reading Bible stories and praying with and those things and nurturing, it all just comes so, uh, so easy for them. But if the guy shows up and models and prays with his kids and reads a few Bible stories, doesn't have to be a Bible scholar. I mean, if he just does some of those things, obviously... It just seems to count more. Sorry, gals. It just, it just seems to count more in terms of, a, uh, of an impact. My mom read me Bible stories all the time. I'll just give you an example. Um, <laughs> prayed with us all the time. I can remember the one Bible story my dad read with us. Moses and the burning bush. I'm 60 years old. I was probably three, and I, can tell, I remember it to this day. It's amazing. It's amazing. The power of a, of a godly family when you've got mom and dad both modeling and living it out before them. But for here, for this dad, something happened at the birth of his son, and he says, I'm going to walk with God. And, uh, and that's a, a very important statement, just uh, even uh, of itself. Walking with God is, uh, in, indicates a more intimate relationship. It is only said of, of Enoch and Noah that they walked with God. One of the other times it's used uh, in, the, in the Old Testament was 
a reference to priests that were walking into the Holy of Holies to be in the presence of God. It's not use of the other patriarchs. And I'm not saying they didn't have a closer relationship with God, but the Bible kind of inserts certain words for, uh, for a reason, uh, and I think it's very important to, to note them. A little more information, Enoch's mentioned two times in the New Testament, and one of them is in, in uh, Hebrews 11, 5 and 6. Now, 11, 6 is a familiar passage. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone that comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. Who is that said about? It's said about Enoch and his walking with God. So that tells us something about his relationship. The whole passage uh, reads this way. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken, he had this testimony that, that he pleased God as part of his testimony. He lived a life that pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. So it speaks about his own faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here's the purpose of mankind revealed to us in the life of Enoch, to have that ultimate relationship and intimacy with God. Notice the things about his walk according to the writer of Hebrews. There's a desire to please God. Yes, he placed his faith in God. Uh, Enoch recognized he was made in the image of God. He could hear, he could respond to God's word, and he determined to do things in his life and how he lived his life in order to please God. Secondly, he says that uh, talks about his faith in terms of his belief in God, and he understood that if he had faith in God, he would be rewarded, and therefore it became a purpose in his life to please God and to trust God, because in that there would be a reward. And notice, I think very importantly, there's a determination to seek God. Notice it's earnestly seek or diligently seek. And so the sum of his whole life could be uh, you know, in those few words, he walked with God. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say you want to do something, and it's another thing to do it. And, uh, and diligence is, uh, is uh, determination is very important. I don't know if you've ever uh, been determined to do something, you know, and uh, uh, I, I don't know if this is just a guy thing or not. You know, sometimes you're you're fixing something and it keeps breaking. It gets worse before it gets better. It kind of makes you mad. And sometimes it's like, I don't care if I have to tear half the house down. I'm fixing it. You know, you get more, more determined, you know, as you, as you go along. I remember when I first took my first stained glass class, <coughs> I, uh, it was very frustrating. Probably didn't have the best, uh, the best teacher. Uh, and, man, I couldn't believe how hard it was to uh, cut a, a piece of glass in a certain shape and everything. Kept breaking, and it's like dollar signs are going. They're not giving the glass away free. You know, it's uh, <coughs> and kind of a frustrating experience. But... But by the time I got that first window together, and I think it was probably pretty ugly, and it looked like somebody who was just learning put it together, uh, but I realized that, you know, this is no easy thing. And, uh, and that was appealing to me. And I thought, you know, this is so hard, I like it. <laughs> and I thought, if I dedicate myself for the next 10 years to learning how to do this, I think I can do it. I'm going to give it 10 years. If I'm still lousy at it, I'll find something else, but I'll give it that long. I, I, I had to be a God thing, I don't know, or just hard-headed or, or something, but uh, uh, it probably took quite a few uh, of those years. But uh, you know what? If you've never built a stained glass window before, if you'll dedicate the next 10 years, you'll be really good at it. <laughs> how, how many of you think if you dedicated 10 years of like all your spare time, you'd be really, you'd be really good at it? It's just a matter of if that's what you wanted to do. You know, we all, you know, admire uh, Mark's ability to play the guitar and get up and lead in, and worship. And there's probably more than a few people that, that have at least a passing thought, oh, man, I sure wish I could do that. I'd love to be able to play the guitar. Why don't you? <laughs> it would just take a lot of work. But if you decided that was more important than anything else, you, you could do it. You could do it. Well, Enoch was determined to walk with God. And that was more important than anything else. Uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy to, uh, in the busyness of life to, to remember to 
call in the name of the Lord and worship God and to read his word. And yes, even adults, not just children in Sunday school, can memorize his word so that you can hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against them. After all, guys, that's what you're supposed to be doing when you're shopping with your wife. When she's looking and browsing, see, that's when you're, you're going over, meditating on the scriptures, see. But if you haven't put them in, see, you can't be going through that, that process. That's why I encourage you to go shopping with your wives. You can be meditating on God's word the whole time. If you have two, little three by five cards once in a while. It works, it works well. But we've got to be determined. None of those things come, uh, come easy. But what an example of the purpose of mankind is to to walk with God. Here's a guy that rested in great faith, believed in God with all of his heart. And just to throw with this the kind of classic Amos 3.3, can two walk together unless they agree to do so? Rhetorical? Of course not. If you're going to walk with God, you have to agree to do so. And that implies surrender. When we come to God and we're going to walk with him, it's not like God's going to be going one way and we're walking with him for a while and they go, wait, 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 uh, Lord, I... Really appreciate everything you're doing for our life. I kind of like to go this way. Why, why don't we go this way? I know we probably say that sometimes in our prayers. But the idea is that, no, we, we surrender. We're, we walk where he's walking. That's, that's the idea. Can two walk together unless they agree? <laughs> well, God's not going to agree with you. You're, the idea is you agree with him, so it implies surrender. Well, let's get on to this other part of Enoch's life, which is very interesting, and that the fact that he is raptured. We see that in verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God <laughs> took him. It's the same language used of Elijah when he was raptured or taken, walking along with his, his uh, uh, little disciple there, Elisha, and uh, uh, he is taken up before him in the chariots of fire. Uh, Paul says the same will, will happen to, to us, perhaps, if we're living at that time when the Lord calls us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, kind of the classic rapture verse of the New Testament. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, and that word caught up is the Latin term is uh, rapturos, where we get our word rapture. We'll be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So uh, Enoch is, uh, again, it's been said that he was walking with God for so long that he was closer to God's house than he was his own. So God just said, why don't you just come on home with me? Uh, and we don't know exactly how it happened, but here's what we do know, that God took Enoch halfway between Adam and the flood. That means for several centuries, people talked about the rapture of Enoch and what a godly man he was and that he walked with the Lord and he was determined to walk with, with God and he had an intimate relationship with God and one day he didn't die, God took him to heaven and they would have talked about that for centuries. People in this age and before the flood of Noah had a, a tremendous witness of God and who he was and what he required and the kind of relationship that you could have with him. But not only that, they had the preaching of Enoch. Now, the other New Testament passage about him is in Jude. And, of course, there's no chapters. There's only one. So uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken uh, against him. What did Enoch prophesy all the way back during this time? The second coming of Jesus Christ that we see in Revelation 19. 19. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, little did he know that there was a judgment coming before that in terms of uh, the flood of Noah. But you've got a, a prophet, Enoch, back during this time, the seventh from Adam, 
Adam's around while this is going on, and he becomes a preacher and a prophet of righteousness and says, not only can you walk with God, and you need to determine to walk with him, and the purpose of our life is to have an intimate relationship with him. Not only that, but there is judgment coming if you decide not to walk with God. There is another world that's out there that we're in a, in a culture war with, they're symbolized by the descendants of Cain, and they are doing their own thing and building their own cities, and they're having great success in what they do and their development of businesses and so forth and, and musical instruments and all the things that they're capable of and all the technological advances that they're making. But they're in rebellion. It's God, and God is going to judge this world one day, and it's coming soon. That's Enoch. It's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Let's go on and just talk about their names here a bit, too which are very in interesting, but uh, interesting fellow. Did Enoch's peers and descendants begin to listen to God and walk with him? Apparently not. <laughs> Tough being a prophet in those, day in those days. Going to get even tougher for uh, one of his grandkids, a guy named Noah. But certainly the hopes were, were rooted in the Old Testament of the idea of walking with God, the rapture as well as the resurrection. One of the oldest uh, books in the Bible is Job, and Job says in Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, whom sh uh, I sh shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold not another. My heart faints within me. Job, again, the, in a sense, he knew about the promise of the resurrection in a bodily resurrection uh, at that. Now, the last thing is the purpose of man is seen in Enoch and the naming of his son. He walks with God. Because of that, he names his son Methuselah, which means his death shall bring. What did the death of Methuselah bring? Well, it brought the flood. Uh, he, Methuselah understands the preaching of, of uh, Enoch and so he names his son Lamech, which means the despairing. So having heard his grandfather preach, he knew that judgment was coming, knew that it was coming soon. And so Lamech names his son Noah, which means rest and comfort. God's judgment is coming soon. It's a despairing time. But in the midst of it, God will take care of us if we walk with him and therefore even though the judgment's coming, I'm naming my son rest in comfort. Because in Genesis 3.15, God promises a Messiah and that he's going to save us. Pretty, pretty amazing what these guys uh, believed and the theology that they had and how, how developed it really was. Now, again, uh, the other names that are mentioned here are very interesting. And I had seen this a number of years ago in a, uh, in a study and a handout from Dr. Mark uh, Eastman. And Dr. Chuck Missler, and, and uh, what we want to see is the obvious here, that they knew judgment was coming. They were holding on to the promises uh, of God. But if you go back and look at all of these names, they're at least worth looking at for a bit of interest. If you go back to, uh, of course, Adam, we already had his name. We knew that it meant uh, man. Seth's name, we said when we got to that, meant appointed Enosh means mortal or frail. Canaan means sorrow. Uh, Mahatlael means praise or bless God. Uh, Jared uh, or, uh, is, uh, means uh, shall come down. Enoch means teaching or commencement. Again, the first of four generations of preachers. Methuselah, we've already mentioned. Enoch, we've already mentioned. Lamech, uh, that word is still kind of rooted in our language today, or we say lamentations or sorrow. Uh, and Noah, we've already had the uh, description of his name, meaning relief or rest or comfort. If you put a composite list together, Hebrew, English, it goes something like this, Adam or man, Seth or appointed, Enosh or mortal, Canaan or sorrow, Mahatlael, the blessed God, Jared shall come down, Enoch teaching, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, the despairing, and Noah, rest or comfort. Now, what these two uh, uh, Bible writers have done have inserted just a few key words. 
If you were to read their names from Genesis 5 in a sentence, it would say, Man is appointed moral, mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Pretty, pretty amazing. And you, and you can make too much you know, out of names. Uh, but the bottom line is that Enoch was determined to walk with God. It didn't matter what the rest of the world was doing. And, uh, and that's where we've got to be as well. He knew that judgment was coming. We know there's a judgment is coming as well. He did his best to warn others of, of what it was and to live his life out before others. And he did it for such a period of time until he was raptured and taken with the Lord. Boy, is this a time to uh, be an Enoch, huh? Anybody want to be an Enoch? Hey, determine to walk with God and then have the Lord uh, rapture you? Otherwise, we could end up like Charlie, living 97 years old. I'd rather just be taken early, you know, and to be with the Lord. But what a great example and what a great message that uh, is here in, in Genesis 5. In terms of Shem and his name being listed first, he becomes first because the Messiah would come through him. The narrative closes, as it did in chapter 4, with a mention of God's faithfulness. There it was, hey... He's born and men begin to call on the name of the Lord. But uh, that degeneration continues until we get to Noah, whose name is Rest, because he and his family, because of their faith in God, would rest in the ark and be protected from God's judgment. Paul takes that over in the New Testament and says, like that ark, we can rest in Jesus Christ because in him we are protected from God's judgment as well. Therefore, they are, in a sense, they go into the ark and in into the floods, into death, but they emerge out victorious in life. In the same way as we will baptize in a few weeks, baptism represents, among other things, that we are in the water in Christ and the judgment does not affect us, and we come out of the water in newness of life, and, uh, and we leave the, the old man behind that we might symbolically, that we might walk with God as a, again, that being a public testimony of our commitment to him. So amazing, uh, this chapter. How do you feel about genealogies now? I could have been two weeks on this, not just one. Amazing how God's word is an intricate message system uh, and that if we'll take the time to study it and crack it open, it's amazing how it can uh, be so relevant to our 